where basically you introduce a text and then you get a summary of the text, which we um, is very useful, for example, for uh, migration communities. Then we, from Wikidata, we can extract ontologies, which means that we can extract um, relations between different entities. And this allows us to build applications that use entity linking, such as this person was born in this year in this country. And also we can extract um, data to build gender bias models that allow us to uh, study this. From the dictionary, we can derive lexical databases that can be just, um, for example, dictionaries or terminologies that can enhance ma machine translation. And even from Wikisource, we can extract historical text, and that would help us do some optical character recognition applications, which means being able to read characters from an image. So we can see that all of these uh, Wikiverse applications actually can be very useful for language technology development. And this is especially possible because of the open licensing of Wikimedia projects. But now let me focus on Wikipedia. I will show you a graph, but let me walk you through this. I have taken a list of the Wikipedias that have more than 3,000 articles, and I have plotted the number of speakers as taken from Ethnologue, so this may be only an estimation, on the x-axis, so on the horizontal axis, and then the number of articles on the vertical axis. Each dot is representing a language, and the more on the right that the language is, the more speakers it has, and the more on the, the more up, the dot is the more number of articles on Wikipedia it has. So we can see how Chinese has a high number of speakers, English has both a high number of speakers and a high number of articles positioning itself in the first position. And then when I was preparing this presentation and I did this graph, I actually learned about Cebuano, which you can see up there. And this is a language from the Philippines. And the reason why it's positioned up there is because in 2012, there was a Wikipedia who developed a bot to produce articles in Cebuano. And because he was Swedish and his wife's native language was this one. So that's just a funny fact that you can take home tonight. But yeah, let's go back to our graph. And I would assume that generally you could say that languages with more speakers would have more Wikipedia articles. And this is because basically more people can write and contribute in that language. So if a language is spoken by millions of people, there are potentially more writers and contributors that can create content for Wikipedia. And this is the line that exactly shows this relationship. So dots that are close to the line, they have a number of articles that you would expect given the number of speakers. However, dots that are above this line have more articles than what we would expect by the number of speakers that that language has. So this is a really good sign. It means that languages have a lot of contributors relative to their size in terms of number of speakers. So we can see some of the bigger languages that would be at the top of our pyramid at the beginning, such as English, German, French, Spanish, and so on. However, I want to zoom in in this uh, mess that we have down there at the bottom. So this is exactly the same graph, but it has been zoomed in. I have only plotted the names of the languages that are above that line. So it means that these languages have more articles than what we would expect given the number of speakers. And actually, if we check, these red dots show which of these languages are minority language in some state. This means that they have more articles than we would expect by the number of speakers. And this shows us the power of the collective effort and community involvement. So minority language communities are very active on Wikipedia. And this is definitely a very valuable finding. So the way I envision it, Wikipedia is the solution because it leverages collective wisdom. It is a volunteer driven content creation platform. The community involves itself not only as a passive user, but also as a content generator. And more importantly, it's a bottom up approach. It comes from the community for the community. Furthermore, the fact that Wikipedia is constantly revised, it provides us with high quality content, which is a very valuable resource. And also it is open source. So again, the open source community benefiting from itself. So since minority languages have a lot of presence in Wikipedia, we can further develop more language technologies. Now we have said that Wikipedia can serve as the solution. 
And we have said that the way that we have to break this digital divide is by increasing our digital presence of our native language. Well, one way to do that, that's very important at Wikipedia as well, is to create new content using translation technology. While human contributions are at the heart of Wikipedia, technology plays a crucial role in increasing this digital presence. So let me just give a few words about it. Um, translation tool at Wikipedia is a very important tool for content generation, where basically you can just create an article from an already existing article in another language. And there has been over 1.5 million articles created this um, created using this tool. And also you cannot start, you can start from scratch, but you can use already some of the machine translation services that will allow you to build this article um, maybe faster or maybe in an easier way. So these are the different translation services that are offered by the content translation tool in the Wikipedia and some of the languages that they covered. Some of them may be familiar, such as Google Translate or Yandex, but actually only the top two are open source initiatives. So let me just give two words about it because I feel you should be familiar with them. So the first one is Apertium. It is a rule-based machine translation system, which means that it is based on rules defined by humans, and it has support for related languages, many of them uh, which are minority languages, in fact. The other one is Mint, which is a self-hosted neural machine translation service by Wikipedia. And in this case, neural means that it um, works with statistical complex computations. It covers more than 70 languages that are not supported by other services. So this is like a great success for open source um, translation at Wikipedia. And it gathers together several open source initiatives such as NLBB, which comes from Facebook research, MATLAB, which comes from Google research, and some other initiatives. I am myself involved in the University of Helsinki with the development, development of Opus MT models. But yeah, main translation services require GPU, which is a type of hardware designed to handle complex computations. And this comes with two issues. On the one side, the costs. GPUs are expensive to operate, especially at the scale that we would need for Wikipedia's translation support. And also with the issue of proprietary drivers, GPUs often require these drivers to function efficiently. And they are not open source, so they don't align with the open source principles of the Wikimedia Foundation. So as I said, the solution is to develop open source fast MT models, MT meaning machine translation, that can run on CPU. And this is exactly um, what I'm working on within the High Performance Language Technology Project and at the University of Helsinki. So let me introduce you to another infinite loop, in this case, on the positive side. We have seen how Wikipedia can be the solution of the generation of resources and can help increase the digital presence online. So we have a higher digital presence online of minority languages, and then we can build resources. Furthermore, we have some open source initiatives that help develop machine translation systems, which help increase our digital presence online. And all of these will, if we have more resources, we will develop better technology. So this is my extended invitation to everyone in the audience to collaborate between language technology research and Wikipedians and work together towards a fully open source powered Wikipedia. That's like um, my dream. So yeah, let me just recap in a couple of minutes so that I make sure you take home some of the messages I want to translate to you today. So yeah, I'm probably sure that you can recognize this image. It's the Tower of Babel, which is an origin myth story that explains why the world's people speak different languages. In the story, humans are punished with different languages so that they don't understand each other. But the way I see it, the linguistic diversity of our world is not at all a punishment, but rather a blessing. And I think that uh, Wikipedia makes sure that we keep it that way for language preservation. So language preservation today is very related to a language digital presence online. And Wikipedians have a key role in the preservation of their own la native languages. We have also seen how community benefits from the community in a way that we enter these infinite loops where everyone helps each other through open source initiatives and also as a takeaway 
message I would like to conclude and say that being a Wikimedian today is more than just contributing to an encyclopedia. It is an act of language activism. So the very first thing you can do if you're a speaker of a minority or endangered languages is just to go and become an editor. And I think that's everything from my side. Thank you very much for today and looking forward to collaborate with many of you in the future. Thank you. Okay, we have time for three questions. Please speak to the microphone so people are like can hear you. Mm -hmm. Uh, good morning. Uh, I just want to thank you because I am uh, Galician. And oh, okay. Yeah, and in October, I, we uh, we are going to start uh, a work group to um, to edit in Wikipedia in in my region. So um, this presentation has given us um, has encouraged me uh, even more um, to to start this uh, work group and to be part of. Mm, I'm, I'm put out our effort to to make uh, the Galician language a little bit more present in the internet, to get the resources and the technology that we still need in in the Galician language. So thank you very much, and I will follow your your work, and and I will it will be a pleasure for me. Thanks very much for this presentation. Yeah, thank you, thank you for starting this this work group. I'm sure you're going to be really successful and. Galician will be put out there. Also, just to mention very quickly, like this pyramid that I showed at the beginning, we can regard it not, sorry, yeah, this one, not only as a pyramid where we have like very different separate categories, but it's rather a spectrum. So I'm probably sure that if you work on Galician, this will move from under-resourced to moderately resourced, and we will keep changing the, the pyramid until it's reversed and looks down, hopefully. So thank you. Anyone else? Uh, hello. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the presentation. Um, yeah, I want to just point out that um, it's it's interesting, very interesting topic. And languages is uh, one of the things uh, that also dragged me into Wikipedia. Uh, <laughs> and but I think what's important in like preserving, especially minority language, is not only Wikipedia, but also this. Uh, collaboration with uh, possibly with quite big media companies like Google, uh, especially with the translate issues. Um, like just recently, we had new update, and uh, I think about twenty languages were added to Google Translate. Uh, they w they draw some criticism uh, because um, of some incorrect translations, but it can be rebooted. So with, now with this. Uh, resources we can make more articles and make languages more visible so it's it needs to be such a collaboration on quite high level i think to do real change uh, but yeah thanks yeah yeah thank you very much i fully agree with this and also i mean as sad as it is research right nowadays and the development of language technologies is led by these companies the issue here is that these companies will not put um, deliberate effort to develop resources for minority languages. So the way that we can put our language into the map is by creating resources online, where editing, creating text, and so on. If the resources are there, if the community is there, they don't mind taking English and then taking also um, whatever other language, if the resources are there, because it's not an effort for them. So also putting our language in the map, that's how we can make sure that it is um, included in this um, technologies led by large corporations, I would say. Thank you. Uh, hello, I have a question. Uh, one more question. <laughs> there was a slide where you show the minority language on a graph. Can you share this again with the red dots? Ah, yes. Yes, yes. this one. Thank you. Um, I, I check the name of the language, and um, a lot of them, even the minority in, in red, actually have the support of local government. So in terms of status, it is important to point out that also above the line, or a lot of the language above the line, they have a status with a government supporting them, and that's maybe why they do better than other languages. 
that was yeah yeah idea. yeah 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 thank you thank you very much for that um contribution true and also i'm myself speaker of one that is um way above the line because of the specifically because of the institutional support so yeah, that's why I focused the presentation on minority languages, not so much on endangered languages, which would be there below the bottom. But my idea would be that all of those dots would go up. But yeah, thank you for pointing that out. I will add it to the presentation. Okay, we have time for one more question. Okay, if not, we can thank Ona once again for her presentation. Thank you very much for having me here. It's been a pleasure.